So, hi, um, Karine. It's lovely to see you here. Thank you so much for joining us for this Neuro Agenda interview. So today I'm joined by um, Corinne Huart, Professor of Developmental Neurobiology and Deputy Director of the Centre for Developmental Neurobiology. So welcome Corinne and hello. Hello. How are you very doing? Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Thank you. thank you for joining us. So just as a very, very brief um, uh, snapshot into what this is. This neuro agenda is exploring and celebrating um, the professional careers and experiences and journeys of the women that make up the neuroscience research centres of the MRC and the CDN. So um, it's a real, um, it's, we're delighted to have you join us. So if it's okay, I'm going to kick off with the first question. And I'm going to say, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to be in this position at King's, going right the way from school, what inspired you in science um, up to this moment? That's a massive question. But <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a massive question, but yeah. it's, it, the short answer is by chance, really. <laughs> yeah. um, I, when I was a kid and a teenager, I was interested in a lot of different things and I wasn't really too sure what to do. And I think the, you know, that's kind of a good message for the young people because you know, not everybody is having a very clear idea of you know, who they are or what they're doing as an adult. And in my case, that was the case. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was keen on a lot of different things. And I decided by chance to choose biology at university because I thought the rest I could explore by myself and biology books are, you know, too dry so I would prefer somebody else to tell me about biology so I did biology like that and then you know in Brussels that's where I'm from and uh, and then listening to the teachers I got you know really quite keen on I had much many more questions and answers and I got really <laughs> addicted to these questions uh, but also the lab parts really you know made me feel you know totally you know, fell in love. I basically fell in love with, with research. Mm -hmm. And so I decided at the end of my undergrad to do a PhD because I wanted to know more about how, how well I would do research and whether I could actually bring something to it. And uh, the PhD worked well. And so I said, oh, you know, why not thinking about postdoc? But at that time, mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that that was the right thing. So I took a break and I went to Mexico and I lived in Mexico for two years. Uh, while I was at the same time lining up my postdoc in the US. So that's, I, I like the idea that, you know, people should take their time to take the right decision. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sticking to that. I mean, I think it was a great move for me, despite the fact that everybody was telling me I was making a mistake, I was jeopardizing my career and all the rest of it. So I think they were wrong. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so I did Obviously. that, uh, <laughs> and I had a great time exploring Central America and working in Mexico and then interacting with a completely different culture, so that was actually very good. Uh, and then I did my postdoc in the States, and there I found my niche scientifically. Uh, while I was doing that, I was planning to stay there for three, four years, and I got basically offered the, to, to continue my work in London instead. And so I stayed two years in the States, and went to London to, the, to UCL to finish the project there. And uh, there I got the opportunity to, to consider the job I'm at now uh, as a young, a young lab head. Uh, and I took the job and I was really happy. I could develop further at King's and do all sorts of other things like leading the center. Uh, and I never really found another match that was actually make me move. So I'm still here. Wow. That's it. Yeah. And there, here you are, and we're really glad of it. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. Um, so, uh, Karine, can you tell us a little bit about um, what your role in the centre? What does it actually entail, and what what does you know your average day look like as deputy? Uh, my my average day is that there is no average day. That's the good thing about it. Um, so it varies a lot. It's a very you know, varied kind of job. And uh, the kind of thing I do during the day is uh, typically speaking to people in my lab and discussing either their problem at the bench or the exciting new data, or I go to the microscope and never look at the real thing with them. Uh, I, you know, write a lot of reports and grants and papers. 
and uh, the, the, you know, I spend quite a bit of time on the computer. Um, and I speak to PIs and discuss science with them in my other kind of role, which is more like, you know, heading and leading or strategize about science at the high level. Um, I also have, you know, a few more boring meetings, <laughs> management kind of <laughs> discussions that are not the, my favorite bits, but that happens too. Uh, so that's kind of, it's the kind of, oh, and, and I forgot a big, big part. I mean, it's not a big part in ours, but um, an important part that I also value enormously is education. So I actually mm. do also teach undergraduate students and postgraduate students mm. by lectures, but also practicals and mm. discussion groups. Mm, amazing. So it's a real variety. I'm really pleased, Kieran, that you you say that you still get in the lab because I'm not sure, but it feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the the sort of when you do become a group leader, that connection with the labs can sometimes get really stretched because you have the Yeah, writers. so so because mm. sorry, because of the variety of the job and the the, the sheer number of possible different directions and different hats you wear very quickly you feel like you might not have enough time to do all of it yeah. and in my case it's all about what keeps you loving the job and i really am you know intellectually i have my best ideas while i look at the real the real stuff like the you know the data mm -hmm. uh and the embryos because i i love um, uh, development uh, and so being in the lab with people and also you have a much more realistic idea of what's possible if you stay in your office and you ask people to do a certain project you know on paper it always looks so much simpler mm -hmm. and so you know having a reality check of how it is uh, at the bench I think it's also very healthy so I, I it's a struggle sometimes because time is not elastic but I think it's so much more important for me to keep that little bit of lab work. Yeah, keep connected to it. So I, I don't know, you've probably answered some of this next question in what you've just said, but what do you like most about your job? Oh, uh, that's, I, I think it's easy. Uh, <laughs> I, I love being, you know, able to, to explore the unknown, to basically be, you know, having a chance to understand something for the first time is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, I would, I, I really, for, for me, what turns me on is to do that with others. So mm -hmm. to have, you know, the pleasure to do this as a team is, is fantastic. And then I also basically uh, love helping and develop new ways of doing things as groups. So, you know, as a leadership thing to kind of be able to think about what would be the next person to hire and make you know having joining us or all this kind of shaping strategies is also lovely mm. uh, and then and then giving back through teaching is is a complete package I, it's i love it i think it's such a privilege to be in my kind of job yeah and i know Corinne, you inspire you inspire you know so many students with the work that you do in the future. yeah you do it's your enthusiasm is is you know it's always in abundance and i think that has a massive nice. impact on on the undergraduates which i think being part of king's as well is um and being in a research center is one of the absolute advantages is it feels like that anyway um that you can get access to that next generation of scientists and still do your research and so that's brilliant so um, I guess my next question, Krim, for you is, have you ever found any, um, or what have been the challenges through your journey in science up till now? Do any of them, you know, what are the challenges? How have you overcome them? Um, both, I think I'm talking from a gender point of view, but any other sorts of challenges, sure. what, ha what they have been? I mean, the challenge that I still face all the time, and I think we all do, is, is the fact that on the research side, the research depends on money and the money depends on us getting it. And so because of the, you know, unpredictability, it's, it, it's so difficult to predict whether a grant is going to make it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, having, you know, the responsibility to maintain the funding for the team and having to you know have this pressure is a very big challenge because 
you you're never sure whether your grant will come will make it or not and so this this business of having to face difficult times of you know having to tell people and luckily in my case because i i write a, way too many grants and you know therefore i i have a lot of failure but i you know i have some success i can maintain it without having the kind of, i mean my my worst nightmare is to have to tell people that they they have to stop working mm -hmm. in the middle of their project because i didn't find the money and so that's basically is the one challenge i think is the toughest one in our profession mm, yeah uh, quite a response and, and it's not gender related so i think it's it's mm. tough no matter what mm. uh, and it is sort of gender related because unfortunately it's still very rare to have you know equal duties outside of work uh you know in terms of a, a you know male and female so if you are in a hetero uh, uh, sexual relationship mm. it's often you as a woman doing more than the guy uh homosexual relationship i think are more balanced mm -hmm. um yeah. and and the thing is is you know then you you know writing grants and if you have to write a lot of them it's mm -hmm. it's on top of everything else you are having on on your back and so that basically leads to the other challenge that i think i uh, you know is an obvious one earlier in the career in my case because uh, you know I, I had my kids a long time ago now mm -hmm. uh it's the fact that you know in my case i started my lab and i started being a mother at the same time and so having to juggle the responsibility of of young kids mm -hmm. and the charge of you know making sure that your lab is successful is extremely challenging yeah. and not you know you're not I, at the time i did it there was zero help on or consideration that that was at all a problem for a female scientist yeah sure. so i think we've been you know we've gone a long way in the last 20 years my kids are now 22 and 18 so yeah wow that's cool i mean it's I mean, still not perfect i think it's still tougher mm, but yeah sure i mean i'm just thinking about um i mean the the center uh does relatively really well with its balance of yeah. male to female members but um there's no denying the fact that as you move up to senior levels that that the number of female members does drop off so do you do you think there's anything that can be done any positive actions that can be taken to increase female representation at at senior levels um in science and across universities yeah, yeah i i think i think now a really big problem is the narrative we actually have uh, when it comes to what it takes to be a successful leader. And I think it's such a male influenced narrative mm. and a certain, and it's not in even a, a male, it's a certain male kind of narrative. So you, the, the concept that, you know, you have to work, you know, over, overly like you know the idea is that if you want to make it you really have to work at it so hard and you do you cannot possibly find that the space for that many more other things in your life than just giving your all to the profession and all this kind of stuff mm. it, it, there's a there's a there's a lot of male oriented uh narrative and i think we suffer from that and a lot of women uh although even successful think that it's not for them because it doesn't seem to be fitting what they want from their own life it's not like you know they are feeling like they are not successful they just don't want to deal with certain aspect of the profession that is really unappealing to them and they're not needed in the profession so i think changing the narrative of what it is to be a leader will change you know the number of women who actually what you know are passionate about staying uh, i think we lose women uh, by not you know having the job attracted to them for wrong reasons mm. yeah sure absolutely yeah. um and i guess you know that's a whole nother interview is how yeah. we can change that narrative um but i'm gonna say thank you so much for talking to us kirin you're very um, welcome it's a, always a pleasure it's it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and um thank you for sharing all of your insights and your experiences and you're very welcome um, i will say goodbye thank you Bye.